Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. This is the second time we are participating. And uh, I'm here not alone, and you will see me moving around. I'm definitely representing the local community, my students, undergraduates, graduates, because none of this work would be possible if there was no demand. So let's remind ourselves about the demand of the nature and local communities. Uh, biomimicry, everybody's familiar with biomimicry? Learning not just about nature, but from nature, so not learning about oceans and all these gorgeous species that we heard today and yesterday. I mean, mainly today. Can I do what? I am on the mic. Is this? It is on. Are you okay? I mean, I can hear myself. Okay. So, and you will hear a little bit about uh, my favorite creature. I'm sure you all have your favorite species. Am I right? Plant or animal? This is mine on a half shell here. I'm missing a half. An oyster. Uh, they call me in different parts of the world uh, an oyster whisperer. So, I will also bring back a map that you saw with the my colleague, John Todd, I'm so humbled to speak after him. And uh, he was showing you the map of a lot of degraded estuaries. And I come from the graduate program at Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And my professor actually established this little bit depressing dead fish sign. So professor is Bob Diaz. And uh, I teach coastal ecosystems, intra to oceanography. I also teach biomimicry, and I'm proud to say that intro to biomimicry that we designed, that I designed at uh, UMass Boston, is the first biomimicry course globally that is also a gen ed requirement for science. So it is just an opportunity to respond to what not only this 21st century needs, it's interdisciplinarity, it's not anymore the competition, it's collaboration between sciences, between students to work together in solving the problems. Because as a scientist, as you know, we are so good on identifying the problem. So whenever you go to Google Ocean, we all use Google, Google Earth every day. But Google Ocean, who, how many of you are using Google Ocean? Come on, stop using it. Because everywhere you go on the world, if you travel a lot, Try not to just do Google Mapping and Google Earth. Go to Google Ocean. You will find a dead fish sign in every single urban place you visit. And then my students were saying, well, we know all the problems. Because when you click on it, it will tell you exactly what the issues are and for how long we've been monitoring it. But what you will not find is a solution. So my students were so depressed that they didn't, couldn't even, uh, listen anymore about the problems that we have. And I'm, together with John, actually, I'm an optimist. So I try to bring an optimism to my classes and to inspire students, to bring them outside. You will see that we are mainly spending our time outside. This is a Boston Harbor. We have at least three dead, four dead um, fish signs. So everybody remembers Finding Nemo and now Finding Dory. So they actually use that image to say, like, how can we replace and fix the fish dead sign and uh, conditions into a healthy, wealthy, and resilient right now and here? And wherever I go when I talk about this, and I was just recently giving a talk to the second global biomimicry conference in Utrecht uh, via Skype, because I think we, and, and we are, you know, we shouldn't be traveling everywhere. We should be communicating with. Um, uh, all the powerful electronics. So that's how our whole initiative started with the Green Harbors project. How can we fix it not just, you know, in a beautiful learning, in a beautiful coral reefs, and I went all over the world, and John, there are so many beautiful places. I was fortunate enough and old enough to work with late Jacques Cousteau, uh, and it's just inspiring to be in those pristine places. But then when you go to urban settings and you constantly plan your vacation because you want to go somewhere where it's healthy, wealthy, and sustainable and resilient, am I right? You don't want to go to some dirty beach where you have, cannot go and lay down or, 
or have a swim. So, but how can we bring that right now and here where we are living, and we are in a brain city, so we should have a, and we are having better and better conditions in our environmental uh, built environment. So when we teach about ecosystems, and you learned a lot about oceans, we are very often dividing them and addressing them separately. What I'm trying to bring you here is something that I learned also from uh, native people, uh, native cultures. I was also fortunate enough to work with and be representing US Senator from Hawaii, uh, Senator Akaka. And I learned a lot from Polynesian and uh, Asian cultures. And this is something that we all have maps where the distribution uh, used to be, what the conditions are now, what are we missing, where are we degrading environment. When we focus on any of them, we sometimes do this advantage and not a justice to nature, because if we are addressing coral uh, systems or mangrove systems or seagrass systems, we can't address them separately from each other. And this is what we are starting to learn, more and more so. We cannot, and this is where I will bring you back to home, I couldn't find a single good map that can actually show you the salt marshes shellfish beds and eelgrass beds that combines them all together. You know why? Because we don't have, sorry, we don't have any more oyster reefs. Just imagine if you have the map like this telling you that 90% of coral systems are totally gone. And that's what's happening with the oyster reefs between 85, and I'll show you the map later, and 90% of oyster reefs are gone. And then we are talking about exacerbated impacts of the climate change and uh, uh, weather extremes, acidifications. You talk, we talked a lot about problems, but then we are trying to learn from nature, but if the nature is missing the systems and species that we can learn from, how are we gonna restore and actually fix the problem. If at the same time, with ocean acidification, you know, when you, when you have some little problems and acid in stomach, what do you take? Tums, what are tums made of? Calcicarbonate. Calcicarbonate. So if you took 90% of oyster reefs that used to embrace, uh, let's say, coast of Texas by seven meter high, when you start um, understanding what historically we used to have, of course that as a, it will, the problems are gonna be exacerbated. So we are missing everything, we are taking from the oceans, we are taking from the coast, everything that's good and adding back what is, what is not. So how can we reverse the whole mental capacity of thinking about functions and systems that should be uh, addressed together and uh, and understand how they collaborate and work together because you can't restore salt marshes without shellfish beds and shellfish beds without salt marshes and eelgrass beds. And then again, when I'm in the science room and I worked in the, Ch the Chesapeake Bay uh, for 10 years, we never sit together and then we are competing for the budgets and appropriations. Is it gonna go for my little scallop or my oyster or eelgrass bed or salt marsh? We compete instead of collaborating saying like, okay, there's a transect that nature actually established for hundreds of millions of years, and the nature actually understands better how the coasts and oceans should be protected and managed. And now we are trying constantly to fight that knowledge with a lot of our mistakes and understanding the feedback loops. Very often, even if you go to New England Aquarium, which I take my students to, you will not find in that transect when you go to, anybody recently been and saw the New England transect of the shoreline? There is no oyster, okay? We have a problem. So I, fi I think <laughs> they're bringing it back and they're trying to understand. This is what we used to have here, we don't have it anymore. You know why? Because you can buy this half shell in every single restaurant. So what are you gonna do next time when you buy it? You also pay for the shell. Hmm? Take, the Take the shells with you. Bring it to the ocean. Little messages. But anyway, this is the, the whole <laughs> approaches that 
We understand <coughs> the feedback loops. And then when we are teaching uh, our students about ecosystems, and then we go to the real life, and then we don't restore them as we teach them. Are you with me? So we need to start bringing us together and not compete for the funding and budgets. How are we going to work at it? Because we know today so much. And we just need to bring, and that's why I love biomimicry, it brings interdisciplinarity together. I love teaching with landscape architects and designers and um, architects, policy makers, everybody who are actually making decisions about our coast, making decisions about how our cities are going to look like. We know a lot about <coughs> what those ecological functions and services are missing and what do we need to bring back. But very often we don't have that space. So this is where we in a Green Harvest Project are trying to understand how can we replace and support those missing uh, functions and services and start building our cities and adapt and mitigate everything what we are now talking about, the climate change and storms, so that we can have a peer that can both support ecological services and functions and human services and functions. Can you imagine, as, as I will show you what the students designed, walking on a pier that not only supports your biking, running, and, and enjoying the, the environment, but also is cleaning the water, has a, an, in, an improving biological diversity because it's not using Portland cement, it's using green cement. I'm sure you are hearing that green cement is actually already available. It's just a matter of time and we will be able to buy it in a, in a Home Depot or Lowe's. But uh, just notice this little image here. This is how the oyster reefs used to look like in Georgia a couple hundred years ago. And this is the image that I wanted to share with you that is scientifically already everybody's using it. It's based on uh, uh, interdisciplinary research uh, from all over the world where basically 85% of oyster reefs have been lost globally. So going back into how to sustainably manage oceans, this is this link that I learned from native Hawaiians. Have you heard of ahupua? It's a beautiful word that can maybe be replaced by sustainability, resiliency. Every native language, what I'm learning now all over the world, has the word similar to ahupua. And that means understanding your environment where you live from the top of the island to the coral reef and open ocean. They understood that a couple thousand years ago. They understood that from perspective of Mediterranean and ancient civilizations because my accent comes from Croatia, from a little island. Uh, and I was surrounded with that whole concept and my grandparents knew how to use the land and the ocean in a much more sustainable way than, than me now with all the knowledge or with, with all our knowledge and technologies that very often we are, we are applying that. So with, when we think about how native Hawaiians were using the land from the top of the mountain with their taro fields, organically, permaculture, whatever you can understand of the watershed, understanding using of the watershed, that each village that they were placed, not only there, but even in the Middle East, they called it culture of water, how to use the water from its source to the end so that everybody has enough and everybody has the same quality, good quality of water. And it would come into the little coastal area where they actually embraced the coast with the artificial pond where they would collect the fish and use the fish in the understanding of uh, the whole ecological life of the fish and sharing it with the village. And they never ever fed the fish. That was aquaculture of native civilizations never fed the fish. Where was the food coming from? All these nutrients and nitrogen that we are now calling pollutants. It was coming from agricultural fields. It all this comes from the land. So how do we understand the land connectivity with the coastal and ocean connectivity? We have a great examples here when we are now all trying in municipalities to address the storm water management, coastal water management, and everybody's talking about phosphate and nitrate and all the nitrogen and phosphate pollution. That is not a pollution in nature. What is it in nature? Food. So 
when you when you think about that, and at the same time, we remove all our shellfish. And you know how much one oyster can filter per day? An adult oyster, which is like from three years to more years. Anybody? It's a bit, it's actually uh, 50 gallons, like your bathtub. <laughs> 50 gallons. 50 gallons of water the size of your bathtub, one adult oyster that is like around three years old. So what we eat are toddlers, uh, because how big oysters can be? I forgot that. Forgot my big oysters. They can be a foot big. You can't slurp that one, can you? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's something that we need to put in a perspective. What, do, what are we doing here with uh, addressing our issues? So that's where my students come with all the ideas. And we are now UMass Boston, our little outside environment, which was one of the, the greatest coves in, in, in UMass Boston. And it was also a hot spot for mitigation and adaptation for Boston living with water. It's all these plans and everything. How are we going to mitigate and adapt uh, Boston area for next Sandy and next storm? So we've been working here. And I can proudly announce that this is the first oyster reef restoration, uh, almost like any DMF, Division of Marine Fisheries, here, because this is illegal. But they know it. Illegal in a, in, a, in a way that we did not bring oysters here. Because this is a trick or something issue that we need to address, and I'm openly talking about that. It's like chicken or egg. If you want to restore oysters, we now know they're gone. We want to bring them back in Mystic, Lower Mystic, where we used to uh, have them before 300 years ago, 200 years ago. We can't bring them, why? Because the policies and regulations are prohibiting bringing oysters in dirty water that are not by standard. So you, you can't clean it without them, but you can't bring them because, why? Because people might eat them. And what we have in those oysters, especially here in a, it will be announced, I work with Conservation Law Foundation on a first ever fish advisory, and I personally included oysters in it and paid for that <laughs> uh, analysis. They have so much bad stuff. Just imagine how much dumping has been going on in Boston for 350, 400 years. So you have a lot of accumulation, bioaccumulation, of not very good uh, toxins and pollutants and PCBs, mercury, uh, even the virus, cholera virus. I mean, there is a lot of, lot of bad stuff that if you eat it, can really damage you. Or if it becomes part of the uh, food web or restaurants, it, it's just something that we experienced recently because I have another project in Wellfleet. We had, this is the first time in 16 years of the Wellfleet Oyster Festival that we d could not serve oysters. It's like going to a concert to hear the band and the band is not there. And you're just like, imagine. So <laughs> it, it was sad. This is something that we need to address. And uh, we basically collected individual oysters from all over the area for five years and brought them in a little culvert. And we have the first ever little oyster reef. Around 150,000 oysters are right here, native oysters. Whoever wants to come and see, call me, and we'll show you what we have here. So it's a reef. Just imagine if how many culverts we have all over urban cities. We've been proposing to use uh, a built, human-built environment to start working with nature, bring it back, try to control and monitor the water quality because the oysters definitely can improve the water quality, but don't eat them. We have to start thinking about that not everything is about us. <laughs> they just need to, you know, this is why, this, this is not me talking, that's the oyster talking. Here. <laughs> Think about me. I'm born to be wild. That's our, our uh, symbol. You will see it like a little oyster. And and we need to start thinking that this is not only about aquaculture and about our food. They, it's a common sense sometimes. Even when you meet with a, a 
policy regulators, they, they, they privately said like, yeah, it's a common sense, but we can't change that. Why you can't change that? We wrote it, we can unwrite it and put, put something better because it's not, it's something that we definitely are working on. So this is what my students now are addressing. This is also Morrissey Boulevard. We are now community by tax money, spending $3.5 million to plan for the Morrissey Boulevard future change which does not still include anything on adaptation or mitigation of the environmental quality or s preparation for the sea level rise of storms. <laughs> and at the same time, that's why we are doing it, because we're getting flooded every time and there is a high tide or a storm. We removed almost not 20 tons of marine debris from here, together with DCR and local community. And this is how my students want it to look like very soon. We don't have to only dream about our big ships that will go around and clean the oceans. We need to also start in every single cove and restore, even if it's few feet of habitat that can actually improve the conditions. You know what the, the, the uh, rejections for our grant proposals were mainly based on? It's too small. Why would you want to restore habitat right there in a cove in such a small area. We need to change that. And they never even came to visit the site. They are on a Google Earth, too small, next. Like we need something big. We don't have a space anymore for big. But we at the same time prove that the width of fringing salt marsh that is just seven feet wide can minimize and mitigate the storm uh, and the wave attenuation by 40 to 50%. Just imagine what we can do when we start understanding the tear effect and relationship with the habitats that were there established in such a vast. And then, then our water quality will improve in the same area. This is where we are uh, in the Seven Hill Cove. Uh, sorry. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. So this is where our students want to be. I will try to summarize a little project and I I think I'm taking already too much time, so I will speed up. We have students, you know, I've been here in Boston a little bit longer than 10 years. Some of my students who took the first biomimicry course now are on Forbes list, like Decca Sorensen with this company. Pay attention to this one. NBDnano.com, they're making water from air based on an Abbey Desert Beetle, and they're creating green chemistry materials like a fog net that are now very popular all over the arid areas in California. Students are for the first time actually being outside. And they said, like, why can't we have a classroom there? Why can't we have a classroom, what John was talking about, on our boats? We have so many ships and fishing fleets. Everything is just sitting there. We could use that. We propose to that. We have co ship containers. We can basically live and, and, and study and do research by doing with the local communities and applying those solutions that we do have in our labs. It's time to get outside the closet. And this is something that we constantly show and prove in a couple hours. Those students were actually thinking that I have a filter below the table or some kind of a mechanism that made this water clear. And it was just by six, no, 10, shellfish, different shellfish species. It's, it's possible and we proved in, uh, in uh, Wealthy. This is a Wealthy project. We started also based on a student a graduate thesis and this is something that students love to do. They're encouraged to do their project, undergraduate or graduate, that addresses their local community needs. So it's not only I'm coming here and telling you your water is really, really polluted, but also I'm coming here and telling you how you can fix it and what we can do together. So we basically restored around from nothing to six million oysters. This is couch, that's why I said like, you paid for your oysters and shellfish, you can take it home um, in a container and uh, bring it back to ocean or your yard. This is couch, so from total mud, one example of living labs and biomimicry approach, we basically placed it very close in the vicinity of the salt marshes I'm still trying to convince and prove people why. Why do we want to do something what nature is showing us how nature did it in the past?
but I don't have enough time to prove that the salt marshes and oyster reefs and eelgrass beds are going to be better when they are together re restored. Why? I don't live a million years or something. It's just we have this historic evidence of this transect. So by only six uh, million oysters and on two acres in three seasons, we actually increased the biological diversity and we improved the water quality by 70%. Um, talking about the nitrogen and nutrients, the pollutants. We need to bring somebody who eats the pollutants, like nitrogen. So, this is just a summary about biomimicry living labs. Uh, we are trying to place them also in, a, in a K to 12 education. I work with a community uh, boat building organization, trying to, in the vision, inspire students to foresee how they want academia to teach them. Where do they want their classrooms to be? Why do they have to have a loan for the rest of their lives? How can we actually change that and bring the solutions and the wisdom together with nature in a, in a small, very local communities? I was lucky enough to get the Fulbright for uh, bringing biomimicry to my home country where I was born. This is my another home country in Croatia and the University of Zadar. So we created a first biomimicry living lab in uh, in the Zadar area where students are actually also trying to understand how can we from those dilapidated uh, Portland cement uh, piers create something that together with the um, uh, designers like Harvison and uh, other landscape architects design something that could be a visionary green harbors for future. We also just recently, my team won a Biomimicry Global Design Challenge uh, we started the next loop. I would encourage you uh, to do that uh, check up of the next loop because, and you can see that this design, microbiology, materials, architecture, we need to start bringing students in a t that type of a setup. That's about the next loop. We are trying to change and retrofit how we are dealing with the stormwater and create our urban harbors for future. You saw these pictures, and I'm grateful to my students because they inspire me. I learned from them because they are the ones telling us what they need, what they want, and what their like, local community would benefit from. So join us on our website and learn more about their projects because they're awesome. Thank you so much.